<laughs> How's everybody doing? Good? A little louder, please. How's everybody doing? Good? Sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that. Everybody eat lunch? Everybody have a good lunch? Cool, cool. This might be a little bit interactive. I'm a little blinded, so I might ask to, like, raise a hand. If you can't raise a hand, that's cool. Not a big deal. Whose first Stir Trek is this? Oh, okay, cool. You digging it so far? Yes? <laughs> cool, awesome. Well, this is my second Stir Trek. Uh, I'm super stoked to be back. Uh, if you see anybody walking around that has a red shirt on, or is a volunteer, anybody that's part of the org, you know, definitely give them a dap, give them a pat on the back, tell them thank you. Uh, this is event is a great, is a really, really great event. Uh, like I said, this is my second time speaking. COVID happened, we didn't have a stir track. So I'm really, really stoked to be back in Columbus with all of you. So if you get a chance, definitely thank the organizers, the volunteers for putting on a great event. Uh, if you get a chance to, thank your sponsors. If it wasn't for sponsors, we wouldn't have events like this. We wouldn't have developer community. You know, it takes money to make this stuff happen, right? And it's great that sponsors came back and put the money up in order to make this event happen and make events happen all over the world, right? Because we went through a horrible time. We're still going through a horrible time. So if you get a chance, thank your sponsors, grab the functional swag and tell them, tell them you appreciate them. Uh, if you're on Twitter, or I mean, even if you're on Mastodon or you're on Blue Sky, I believe this is the official hashtag for the event. So if you're tweeting and doing all that stuff, uh, definitely throw hashtag Stir Trek on there and also tag Stir Trek. That way they can like track the interaction, track the engagement. I like doing it for my own numbers. Uh, but yeah, this is the official hashtag for the event. This is another one, and I add this in all of my slides, all of the talks I do. I talk a lot about accessibility all over the world. I do workshops in accessibility. I do talks on vanilla CSS. I do talks on feature flags and A-B testing. Uh, but hashtag developer community. The reason I put this in here is because y'all are my lifeblood. Y'all are the reason I do what I do. Y'all are the reason I travel. Y'all are the reason I teach and mentor and talk and build relationships within the community. It's very, very important to me. Y'all are very important to me. And if it wasn't for any of you here, I wouldn't be here. You know what I mean? So if you are, this is more or less for me, and it's sort of in the community in general, just to track the, the engagement within the developer community, see what talks people are in, see what events people are in, see what new things people are learning. So it's really, really cool. So if you are on Twitter or any of those social media platforms, throw hashtag developer community on there as well. Uh, there's a video that I play, and I'm gonna play it. This next slide is the video, uh, and it's by Apple. I am not sponsored by Apple. I'm not getting paid by Apple. I'm not endorsed by Apple. Uh, but there's a reason that I play it. So I wanna show it for all of you. This is a very powerful video. And hopefully if the, the, the interaction part of this, if you, if you can answer and shout it out, cool. If not, that's fine. There's a reason I showed this video before every single accessibility talk that I give. And if you've seen me give an accessibility talk anywhere around the world, you've seen me play this video. And this is an older video, but it's very, very relevant. Why do you think that I play this video before every single accessibility talk that I give? Shout it out. I want, if you can, like I said, I want to hear everybody's answer. If they have an answer, I love hearing what people have to say. And there's no right answer either. Why do you think I show it? Shows a target audience. What else? Variety of accessibility issues. What else? Emotional connections to technology with people with disabilities. I love that. I really love that. I haven't heard that one yet. What else? Awareness and empathy. What else? Perspective from someone that has a disability. That's great. It shows that the bigger picture is not us, right? We can build stuff all day long that we think is cool, that we think is going to get a lot of traction. 
But at the end of the day, that might not work. When I started building on the web back in 1996, I'm dating myself, I'm old in web years. I used to use black backgrounds with super small lime green text or purple text and everything was centered. We didn't have CSS, JavaScript wasn't a thing yet. I thought that stuff was cool. And yeah, the color contrast might work, but it doesn't mean it's gonna be cool for somebody else. We really need to be thinking about the big picture. We need to be cognizant of the big picture. It starts with design. If there's any designers in here, designers have to understand accessibility. They have to understand color contrast. They have to understand user flow. They have to understand how to use a keyboard, right? To, use, to, to be able to use a website interactively and not have to use a mouse. But everybody that has a hand in that piece of the web needs to care. And keep in mind that it's not just us. It's the rest of the world that we're building for. I get this question a lot. Why do you care so much about accessibility, Chris? Why do you talk all over the world on accessibility, Chris? Why would you give up a weekend to talk about accessibility, Chris? The answer for me is simple. And I don't like using words like simple and basic, but this is an, a simple answer for me. My mom is a boomer. She's going to turn 67, actually, this month. She's about this big and she wears glasses. She just was diagnosed with macular degeneration of one of her eyes. So we have a visual disability. I have to talk really loud sometimes for her to hear me. Even if it's from me to Jeff, I have to yell because she, she's starting to lose her hearing. Now she doesn't have a hearing aid or anything like that yet, knock on wood, but she has a hearing disability. My mom has arthritis. She has really bad bone structure and joint structure now that she's getting older. She has a mobility disability. I could have talked to her 20 minutes ago and told her that I was gonna be speaking at this conference. She could have called me five minutes later and said, what are you doing? Where are you at? I have no clue that I told her what and where I, where I was at and what I was doing. So we have cognitive disability. But she could remember something from 1977 like that. What she had on, what, she, what shoes she had on, what place she was at, who she was with. So we have cognitive disability. Now luckily, she doesn't have anything currently right now that's visible as far as like a temporary or a situational impairment. Broken hand, broken arm, broken finger. I'm not a newborn anymore. She doesn't use a uh, computer anyways, she's a typewriter. Like she could still do stuff on a typewriter. If I put a machine in front of her, she'd have no clue. She still has a flip phone. Love you mom if you're watching this. Chances are she's not watching it. But still, she doesn't have any type of those situational or temporary impairments. With that being said, she has four out of five different types of disabilities, not including ones that are internal and that we don't really think about. If I can make an accessible user experience for her at the end of the day, I have done my job as a developer on the web. I have done my job as a worker on the web because I am obligated to give amazing accessible user experiences to everybody. We're changing the world. Yes, we make money, but we are changing the world. If you really think about it, we are making lives better. The stuff we're shipping is saving lives, potentially. Keep those things in mind. If you didn't know what your why was, I hope after this talk you can go back and maybe that light bulb will go off for you and you can reflect and figure out what that is because it might be you yourself. Thank you for coming to the talk. That's me, I'm Chris. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter. Think Mastodon, Blue Sky, Salt and Burnham. If you're a Supernatural fan, you will understand that reference. I'm a developer advocate. I work for Split Software. We are an experimentation and monitoring platform. So what does that mean? We have tools for A-B testing, feature flags, canary release, trunk-based development, stuff like that. So if you want to know more about that or you're interested in A-B testing and feature flags, come talk to me after the talk. Uh, I hold recognitions in these things over on the side here. Uh, Microsoft MVP and ABCs and Auth0 Ambassador, etc. Progress Ninja. So yeah, that's me. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, you can scan that. If not, you can just open up Twitter or open up Blue Sky or Mastodon. If you're on Blue Sky, and search search for Salt and Burnham, and you'll be able to follow me there. Thank you for coming to the talk. There are other talks going on right now. Y'all chose to be here. I'm very grateful. Common accessibility pitfalls, climbing out when you fall in. Question time. If I asked you how many people around the world had some type of disability, what would your answer be? Right. 
percentage, anything. It doesn't matter. I got one answer one time at a conference, and I thought it was great, and I put it in this talk. And I'm wondering if anybody else has that. Do what? More than you think. I like that. I like that one, more than you think. How about everyone? Somebody told me this at a conference. They said everyone, and I was like, wow, you are so right. Because if we're not talking only about physical disabilities and impairments, if we're talking about internal ones as well, then I would say everybody. I wouldn't say anybody is, you know, is protected from anything, right? I would say everyone. Technically, one billion people around the world have some type of disability, and not just limited to the five that I was talking about with my mom. So when you break that down into a percentage, it's 20 to 25-ish percent. I would say it's more on the higher end, maybe 35 to 40 percent, especially if you count all of the internal different types of internal impairments and disabilities. So let's take this 20, 25% and let's break it down into the real world. Chris, nobody that works for our company has a disability. We don't hire people with disabilities. And everybody that's using this product, it's all internal. These are all internal tools. No, none of our people have a disability. Has anybody ever heard that before? I have. I call BS every time on that. You need to internalize that percentage. I've worked with developers, QAs, and VAs who are deaf, colorblind, have other different types of cognitive disabilities. They're using the product. Whether they're a consumer using that product, or internally they're using that product, or they're testing or developing that product. I worked with a developer one time, and we were building out some graphs, and the color choices weren't the greatest, but he was colorblind. He had deuteranopia. And he couldn't tell the difference between when one piece of the chart turned into the other color because it was different shades of red. And he had no clue. And he grabbed me, he said, Chris, he said, I, can't, I don't know the difference between these colors. What can we do? So we either figured out a way to work with the brand to change that color, or we added dividing like outlines around each piece of that chart. So that way there was a break and then the next one started. You need to internalize that percentage Nobody has to tell you they have a disability. They're not obligated to walk up to you and say, hey, my name is Chris. I have protonopia. Nobody has to do that. They don't have to offer that information. They're protected by law. Internalize that 20 to 25%. Internalize that 35 to 40%. And then we have the external piece of that as well. Who has heard this term before? A11Y or Ali or Ally. Okay, cool. Do you know what the combination of letters and numbers is called? Not what it means, but what it's called. Yeah. Accessibility. Yes. The technical term for the, the combination, though, of letters and numbers. There's a specific term. It's called a numeronym. And what a numeronym is, is you take, let me see if this is gonna work, there we go. You take the first letter, you take the last letter, you, put them, you count the letters in between, so we have 11, and then you get your term, you get your numeronym, A11Y. So if you're familiar with internationalization, if you work in internationalization, I18N, that's a numeronym. Localization, L10N, that's a numeronym. Does anybody work in the Kubernetes space? I'm sure you've seen K8S or Kates, right? That's a numeronym. So it's just a shorter version of the word internationalization, accessibility, localization, Kubernetes. So anytime you hear that, you're like, oh, I know what that is. It's called a numeronym, and that's what a numeronym is. Great. So what is accessibility? This is a great question. This is a, sort of a loaded question. It needs to be broken down a little bit more. The actual question is, what is web accessibility? What does that mean? This was from the W3. Web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web. But I have a problem with this definition, and I think that it's been updated since, but this definition is not right, in my opinion. Because if you really think about it, this is an open web. And if an open web is an inclusive web, and an inclusive web means a web for all, then this sounds better. Web accessibility means that everyone can use the web. Everybody should be able to have an amazing, accessible user experience, whether or not they have a disability or an impairment. And if we build with accessibility in mind first, 
instead of retrofitting it, A, we're not going to create as much problems. B, we're not going to extend timelines. But C, what matters the most is it's going to be beneficial for everybody. Now, is every accessibility feature beneficial for everybody? No. Not everything is going to be beneficial to somebody that doesn't have some type of impairment. But it's going to benefit everybody in general as a whole because we don't have to start making a bunch of different experiences. We're here to make one, not five. Accessibility is not just a requirement. It is a must. It is something that you should be caring about from the beginning. Like I said, you don't want to retrofit something in six months down the line. You don't want to wait for a lawsuit to come through because accessibility wasn't built in from the beginning. All too many times, accessibility, performance, security are always thought of at the end. And all of those are under the umbrella of UX, the user experience. And when stuff hits the fan, then everybody starts losing it because the performance is bad, somebody didn't sanitize some React HTML, and now there's some cross-site scripting going on. And there's a lawsuit because the accessibility of that product is not accessible. The website's not accessible at all. You got to care. And if you don't care, then you're just going to be like this, and you're just going to be a naughty, naughty person. And I don't know if we can be friends at that point. I'm just kidding. We'll still be friends. It's a learning opportunity. So when we talk about these different types of disabilities, I talked about it with my mom. There's five main ones, but they're not limited to these. We have hearing disabilities, so we have conductive hearing loss, uh, sensory neural hearing loss, and a mixture of those two. We have cognitive disabilities, math comprehension, reading comprehension, uh, what our, uh, autism, different levels of the spectrum. We have mobility disabilities, arthritis, uh, MS, temporary and situational impairments, broken hand, broken arm, broken finger, a parent with a, with a child that needs to hold their child and still use a computer, still use a keyboard. They can't use a mouse at the same time. And then vision disabilities. And the vision disabilities, there, there's a huge, huge, huge list of vision disabilities, but a couple of those are field of vision, color vision deficiencies, or CVD, which is color blindness, deuteranopia, protonopia, tridenopia, and monochromatic. One in 33,000 people have a monochromatic color vision deficiency, where they see in shades of gray. So we have these to think about and be cognizant of when we're building on the web. Now that's great. Do we have guidelines though, Chris? Yes, we do have guidelines. We have a handful of different guidelines. And hopefully, if you know about these guidelines, you're following the WCAG 2.1. These are all like the book, right, of how to build these amazing user experiences, ways to do things, WCAG 2.1, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. These are what you should be going with when you're building on the web. Uh, but there is a small caveat. Not all of the things that are in the WCAG have conformance levels. I'll talk a little bit about more about conformance levels here in a minute. Uh, but not all of them have those conformance levels. So just one thing to keep in mind. So we have this thing called POR, and POR kind of builds down to the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And it's all based around these four guiding principles of accessibility. And those four principles are perceivable. So is it you know, easily viewable, operable? Can I use different types of technology? Understandable, does it make sense? Does the language make sense? And then robust, can I use it across a handful of different types of, of technologies? whether that's a screen reader, a sip and puff machine, a tap machine, just a keyboard, a vertical mouse. A lot of people use vertical, vertical mice because of carpal tunnel. So if you use it back and forth like this, opposed to doing it this way, can it be used across multiple devices like that? So let's talk about conformance for a little bit. There's three different levels of conformance currently in the world today. We have A, AA, and AAA. So we have three of them. At some point, they are going to be changed to bronze, silver, and gold. I'm not sure when that happens. Uh, a couple awesome accessibility people that you can ask. Well, there's a handful of people. Uh, Marcy Sutton is one. Todd Libby, Homer Gaines, uh, a handful of other people out there you can ask and see when these conformance levels are going to change. If you're doing everything right, you should be hitting level A automatically, right? You want to strive for double A, whether you're a freelancer or you're working as a contractor or even a consultant or even within an organization. 
you want to be able to hit double A 2.1 because then you're doing things the right way. And in accessibility, nothing is ever going to be 100% accessible, ever. That's just the way it is. Technology changes, people change, teams change. Nothing's ever going to be 100% accessible. But you want to try and get to that level as much as you can. And by following these different types of conformance levels and guidelines, is going to get you there. Great. So we talked all about these things with accessibility. We talked about different types of disabilities and impairments. What are the pitfalls? What is the low-hanging fruit that is out there that just is everywhere, pretty much? And these are the things that can be worked on and fixed from the beginning. And these are things that can be fixed relatively painlessly, as long as it's not too far down the line where there's no going back, which you can always go back. Stop using divs. A div means nothing. If you look it up, a div is just a divider within the page. It just divides a block of content. There's no semantic meaning behind it. There's no accessibility states and properties behind it. It doesn't do anything. Stop using a div. You should be using semantic markup. Now, it's a lot more difficult to retrofit semantic markup in after it's already been shipped. You should start with semantic markup first. Access accessibility, semantic markup is accessible by default, right out of the box. So you don't have to worry about using things like ARIA right away. I'll have to get into ARIA later. We have accessible markup with HTML5. The advent of HTML5 changed a lot of things. We have a header, so you should be using a header. Header will usually hold a logo, primary navigation, not to be confused with a heading level element. Those words get thrown around a lot. Header, heading, those are two different things. A header is a block of content. A heading or a heading level element, H1 through H6, defines the, the document structure. That's what that's used for. We have a nav. So you can use this for your navigation, primary navigation, secondary, tertiary. Use this because it has semantics behind it. We have a main element. So the main element's going to house everything that's usually between the header and the footer, whether that's different types of component cards, uh, maybe some content, some pictures. You're going to want to use your main element right there between your header and your footer. And then we have an aside. Now, an aside, I don't know how many people actually use aside. Aside was really created because for people that wanted to create a sidebar, Literally, that's what it means. A side is for usually for a sidebar. Uh, but you have that at your, your advantage to use that when you're building out your application. And then we have sections. You can break down everything that's in your main into a section, whether that's a vertical or horizontal section. Hopefully, you're using vanilla CSS and grid and flexbox. You can have different sections that you can put on your grid and your flexbox. So you have sections. And then we have the footer. Footer usually goes at the bottom. It has copyright information, maybe some secondary or tertiary navigation, has some other different type of meta information in there, maybe a social media component. That's what your footer is. So you don't need to be using divs anymore. The only time you're ever really going to use a div is if you're building something that is not already in the spec, and it's something super custom. Then you're going to use a div. But other than that, semantic markup is there to use, and you should be using it. One of the big reasons that matters the most is with screen readers. Now, hopefully, all of you are testing. How many, how many front end devs are in here? Raise your hand. All right, back end devs. Uh, designers. Even if you design a little bit, that's cool, Ed. Put your arms down, Ed. Uh, QA or BA? Couple. Director, product manager, product owner? Cool. All right, sweet. Well, it doesn't matter what you're doing, because if you're testing this application, you should be using a screen reader. A screen reader is going to read to the user, or sound out to the user, where they're at in that page. And it's going to do that based, you know, from top to bottom. And it's going to say where they're at. You're in like a header, or you're in the content info, which is the footer, or you're in the main section of the page. And you can use different tools within those screen readers to jump between those sections. One that comes to mind is Mac VoiceOver. If you're on a Mac, VoiceOver is built in. It's built in on an iPhone, an iPad, and Mac OS. You can use Mac VoiceOver. 
There's a tool called the rotor. You can spin up the rotor in your screen reader and you can choose what piece of the page you want to hop to right away if you don't want to navigate directly through it. If you're on a Windows machine, you can use NVDA. That's a free screen reader. So you can use that when you're testing. Uh, and if you're a Linux user, which is great because I love Linux, if, you, if you're using a Linux distro, you can use Orca. Orca is a screen reader for Linux distros. And when you're testing with a screen reader, please, please, please do not read the screen and listen to it at the same time. I call that cheating. That's not the way it works in the real world. If you're gonna test with a screen reader, close your monitor down a little bit, or if you're at a desktop, maybe write some CSS, blur the screen. There's other plugins and tools out there in browsers that you can use. Throw a black t-shirt or, or a blue t-shirt or a dark colored garment over the monitor and listen to the interaction as you're using the keyboard. See if it makes sense to you, right? Because you gotta put yourself in the user's shoes. It's one of Jakob Nielsen's design principles. I think there's seven or nine of them. And one of them paraphrased is putting yourself in the user's shoes, right? You don't wanna have them thinking about the experience. They wanna be able to use it seamlessly. So don't cheat, don't listen and read at the same time. That's not cool. Another piece of low-hanging fruit, one of the pitfalls you see out there is alt attributes and images. How many times have you put an image somewhere and you didn't put an alt attribute? It happens, right? Especially if you're using some type of content management system that doesn't allow, sometimes they don't allow for alt attributes, uh, sometimes they're left out. If you're on Twitter or Blue Sky or anything like that, I am a big proponent on making sure that you always are putting alt text in any type of media that you're, 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 you're you're putting out there on social media, if you can, if, if it's possible to do that, and there's ways around that. Sometimes you, you can't, sometimes you can. But all the attributes, they're huge. The one thing about all the attributes too is you wanna make sure that they're short and descriptive. Now this has always been the, the thought that they need to be short and descriptive. But the thing about that is, I was at a conference last year and it got brought up that what if somebody tweets a picture of something from NASA, like a huge nebula, right? Or you're talking about Stranger Things, hopefully you dig Stranger Things, I love Stranger Things, and you're tweeting a picture of Eddie fighting a Demogorgon. Would the short and descriptive text work at that point? I don't know, that's a great question. Because as a user that can't see that image, you're gonna want to feel that image. You know what I mean? So as the person tweeting it, you're gonna to wanna to convey to the user what that image is all about. If you just say, Eddie getting, fighting Demogorgons, cool, that's sweet. I'd rather, he, I'd rather see that image in my mind. You know what I mean? Eddie fighting Demogorgons in the upside down with fire and smoke and burning brimstone, like that conveys feeling. That's what I wanna hear. So at that point, would the short and descriptive work? Mm, not in that case. So if you know what? I'm saying right now, if you wanna add everything that you have in order to convey that feeling of that image, go for it. Because it's just gonna make that image a lot better for somebody else. This is the most important part of this element right here, your alt attribute. It's not a tag. We don't, these, aren't, these aren't called tags. It's an alt attribute and then you have text within that. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that's always present anytime you're building out an image or if you're using something that's generated, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that there's, image, there's, there's alt text within that attribute. And if it's not up to you, it's up to the content team or a design team or a marketing team. And if they don't have a good way of figuring out what that should be, start having the conversation. Open up the collaboration and figure out what the best way to convey that image is because it's gonna matter down the line. So here's an example. I have a picture of Alice and it's just Alice. Like would this work as alt text within an alt attribute? No, no, it's not gonna work. Alice who? Are we talking Alice in Wonderland? Are we talking Alice from the Brady Bunch? I don't, who's Alice, your neighbor, your aunt? I don't know. So would this be better? Alice looking down a rabbit hole. I would say so. Now I don't know Alice's last name, I don't know if anybody knows Alice's last name. You might know Alice's last name. If you know Alice's last name, please let me know so I can update this slide. But yeah, this would, this would work for alternative text, alt text within that alt attribute. 
Alice looking down a rabbit hole. Then we have decorative images, or what is also referred to as eye candy. The thing about these is that you still need to have your alt attribute present. It's very much up to the author whether this conveys meaning, if it's part of the context for the, for the experience. If not, you can leave it empty, but you still, ugh, you still have to have a, an empty string or empty quotes. If you don't have that alt attribute there and it's just empty, you'll get dinged in an accessibility audit. 100, 100 times, 100% 100 you're, you're gonna get dinged. That also brings to the next point, hopefully that you're using some type of tooling to test for accessibility and audits. And if you wanna know more about that, we could talk about X, we could talk about accessibility insights, and hopefully you're using something to test all of this stuff. But if you don't have that all the attribute, you're gonna get dinged in an audit, and that doesn't need to happen. Like, that's something that does not need to go out in production without that. But it's very much up to the author. So you can have those conversations, whether that's you and you feel that provides context to the experience. If it doesn't, you can leave it empty, but make sure it's there. Never, never, never leave that out because that is, like I was saying, that is the one thing you don't want to get dinged on in an accessibility audit because it's almost accessibility 101 at that point. You want to make sure that that all the attribute is there. Another big one is color contrast. All too many times colors are used that just don't work. They just don't work or they might have a lot of high contrast, but that might still not work for somebody, right? Black background with super lime green, yeah, those colors pass. Whether you flip them and you flip them back, they pass a color contrast audit. But it doesn't mean that color contrast is going to work for somebody else. And if the colors are off, then you start having those conversations again with your design team, your marketing team, your branding team, even changing the hue or the saturation or the lightness just a little bit can push you over that threshold where you're gonna pass your color contrast. Can anybody read that? Barely? I can barely read it on my screen. I would, I would hate to be out there with y'all and try to read it. Can you read that? Same text, different color. You can see this color contrast is horrible. Some people can still read this though, believe it or not. They've done it and they blew my mind at conferences. I'm like, how did you read that? If I were to tell you a story and I added you as a character, would you want to be in the movie? This is good color contrast. The minimum for double A is 4.5 to one. That is the threshold. So you have to be above 4.5 uh, to one if you want to pass double A conformance with color contrast. You should be doing everything to get to double A. That's just the way it is. The way this is figured out, the ratio, I don't know. There's a little bit of math behind it. Actually, a lot of math behind it. Uh, but if you were to talk to, like it was Todd Libby, Todd Libby actually knows the formula behind this. So you could hit him up on social media and ask him. He loves talking about color contrast. He was actually on some accessibility boards for the W3. So definitely uh, hit him up, ask him about that. If you want to know more about it, uh, you don't have to know about it. Triple A minimum is seven to one. So it's very, very different. It's a lot higher. Now the thing about triple A conformance, you're never gonna hit triple A conformance 100%. You're not expected to hit triple A unless you work for some type of government entity or you're in academia and you work in education and you're building experiences like that. You don't need to, you can try to go triple A if you're using great colors, you'll pass AAA, but you might fail AAA somewhere else, but that's okay. You don't have to push for AAA, even if you, you can. But it costs a lot more money, it takes a lot more people, a lot more resources to make things AAA compliant. Perfect example, if you're putting a video on the web, you have to have transcripts. This is how it was, this might have changed recently. But you have to have transcripts, you have to have closed captions, and you also have to have an accompanying video, like a picture-in-picture, picture, of somebody doing sign language. And that should pass AAA. You can't always get all that stuff at one time. But as long as you have closed captions or transcripts in replace of those, I think you'd be doing okay. Here's another one. Buttons versus links. How many times are we creating buttons that look like links and links that look like buttons? Right? What's a button used for at its core? Action, 
Exactly, perfect, thank you. What's a link used for? Navigation, right? We have a button element to use that out of the box has accessibility states and properties. And it has you know, interactions, so you can use JavaScript with it. If you're, you know, if you're a front-end dev or a back-end dev or a JS engineer, right, it already has accessibility baked into it, and you can also use it because it has a, an event. You know, it has a, a click event or a push event or whatever. There's a great article by Marcy Sutton. If you don't follow Marcy, definitely follow Marcy. She's awesome. It's a whole article on the links versus buttons. Uh, it's marcysutton.com slash links, and there's dashes between this, links versus buttons in modern web applications. It's an article from a few years back, but the principles still apply. Don't use a button if you're doing it, you know, you're creating a link for navigation and vice versa. There's other things around that as well, but making sure to keep those things separate when you're shipping down your experiences. Focus is a big thing as well. I love talking about focus. I give a talk on focus, actually. Uh, is everybody familiar with what focus is? A little bit? Cool. So focus is the, how can I put this? Focus is the visual indication that is something, something is being interacted with on the page, right? So you usually get a focus ring. By default, user agent styles, it's usually gray or it's blue, depending on the browser. It could be dotted, it could be inset dotted, it could be dotted on the outside with a, it, there's a handful of different ways, because there's a handful of different browsers not including developer browsers and nightly browsers, they all handle focus differently as the way it's presented to the user. It's just CSS, it's a pseudo class, this is how you write it, colon, focus. Don't do this though, please don't do this. If you remove focus, whether you use outline zero or outline none, you're removing focus for everybody everybody is, is, is not able to see it anymore. Don't do that. Does anybody use a CSS reset? If you use a CSS reset, let me know. Yeah, one-ish. Okay, so has anybody heard of normalize? Okay, what about Eric Meyer's reset? Cool. So you should be using a CSS reset. I personally, there's different schools of thought. Some people say no, some people say yes. So what a reset is, a reset just resets the browser. Resets the user agents to a blank page, a, a clean slate. That way you don't have to worry about padding, you don't have to worry about how the, the browser's gonna handle borders, you don't have to worry about how they're gonna handle margins and tables and all of that other stuff because all of the user agent styles have their own way of doing things. And that's across each browser, it's gonna be different. Remember when we had jQuery back in the day? Kind of to normalize the browser for JavaScript? Well, that's what a CSS reset is. If you use normalize, and this might have changed, but normalize didn't have anything related to focus, which is sort of a bummer, but it is what it is. Eric Meyer's reset, he does have this in his CSS reset. But he explicitly tells you right after this to reset the focus after you clear out the browser styles. You usually wanna put this first before any CSS that you write that way because the cascade works, it comes top to, the, top to bottom, so once everything is reset, cool, then it's gonna pull in the other CSS that you write and the page is gonna be displayed like that. So make sure that you're always putting focus back in because a lot of times this is removed. A designer or a marketing person or a VP or a director says, I don't like the way this looks. I don't like the gray focus ring or that gray ring around buttons and links I don't like the blue ring around buttons and links. You can match the focus to your own branding because it's just CSS. You could change font colors, you can change font sizes, uh, the weight, background, stuff like that. You can do all of that stuff with focus. So if somebody says they don't like it, here's your opportunity to go back and start communicating and collaborating on ways to keep that in but still match the branding. Has anybody heard of Focus Visible? Cool. Focus Visible is great. I learned about Focus Visible uh, years ago. This is how you write it. It's just colon focus dash visible. And the way this used to work was, this used to be a polyfill. 
And this was created by amazing engineers at Google, uh, Alice Boxhall, Rob Dodson, a few other people. And this is, this is older. Now it's supported in the browsers, so you don't have to worry about the polyfill and the way it was called. It used to be called Focus Ring Visible. I think it was Focus Ring Visible, like Moz Focus Ring Visible, because remember vendor prefixes? We used to use those. Now we don't need to do that that much anymore, or if at all. But this was a, this was a polyfill. Then you had a bunch of JavaScript, and you had to pull in that JavaScript, little bit of CSS, but it was like a chain selector, so you had a bunch of stuff tagged on the end of it. And the way this works is that it's based on heuristics. So if you were to use Focus Visible within your application, the machine knows, or the browser knows, whether or not you're using a keyboard or whether or not you're using a mouse and a trackpad. So it will add or take away that focus ring based on that. It's really cool how it works. This is an older screenshot from Can I Use, uh, but we got great support, right? We got good support all across the board. Uh, where'd it go? IE, not so much. Hopefully you're not building for IE anymore. But like we have good support pretty much. This is Opera Mini. Man, nobody uses that, I don't think. But good support across the board. There was a time when it wasn't supported at all. And that's why we needed that polyfill. So this is how it works. In this example right here, I'm just using the keyboard and I'm going through and I'm just tabbing through and, and then can, you know, alt tabbing back up. So the focus ring is getting added in. If I just use the mouse or a trackpad, it's not gonna add it for everything, like the buttons, because the buttons are listed to not show that focus ring with everything that it's doing behind the scenes. So it's really, really cool. I had somebody come up to me at a talk, after I gave a talk and I, I was demoing this, I did a bigger demo on this specifically, and they came right up to me afterwards and showed me their, their GitHub repo at their org, and they filed an issue, and they said, I'm gonna put this in, this is amazing, I didn't even know this was a thing. Like, that's cool. For that light bulb to go off, right? To be able to have somebody, show somebody something that they can implement within their own projects and their organization, that's powerful. That's powerful to me. So that's really cool. So if you're not using it, you can check it out. I think I have a code pen out there that, that plays with this a little bit. It's an older demo. Here's another one. Has anybody heard of Focus Within? Now, now mind you, this is all CSS and accessibility. You can do accessibility with CSS. So just throwing that out there. If you're a CSS, old school CSS developer like me. Anybody heard of Focus Within? Cool. Focus Within. I learned about this uh, a few years ago from uh, Una Kravitz. If you're not following Una, she's awesome. Definitely give her a follow. Uh, but she posted about this on Twitter uh, maybe three-ish years ago. I think before 2020, so maybe 2019. I don't know. I can't math right now. Uh, but this, one, this is really cool. It's got great support as well. Uh, if you're not using Can I Use, I would be using Can I Use. That's like another book to figure out what's supported with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It'll talk to you, it'll tell you different things with things that are behind features, uh, feature flags, browsers that are supported, browsers that aren't supported. There's just a bunch, a bunch of information in there. This is Focus Within. And the way this works is you would use Focus Within on like a parent element, uh, like a form, for instance. And the second you focus to that form, that whole entire form gets focus. So not just the button or the inputs, everything gets focus. So there is no reason to not think that you're not inside that piece of that component. And there's a reason I say that. And that this is a very, very far-fetched example, but I was talking about this and I was talking about two blind brothers, which I'm gonna show here in a minute, and I was talking about focus. And there's a reason that this comes in really, really handy, and I'll show that once I run through the, the two blind brothers. JavaScript developers, any JavaScript devs in here? Cool. We have a focus method. This is how it works. You have the focus method that you can use in JavaScript to shift focus back and forth. Let's say you have a menu that's off to the side or like a menu that slides in and out. That doesn't have focus because it's sort of out of the DOM already. So you can take that focus back into that main window and you can start using it. Or let's say you have navigation within a side, like on a side, right? Or some type of menu that slides out. And you go through a navigation piece and you need to focus back over to the main window. 
you can do that and then you can focus back over and then select another link or whatever the case may be and go back into the main window. That's when you would use the focus method. Okay, is anybody familiar with two blind brothers? Okay. I showed this years ago, I learned about it, and it's two brothers, they create clothing, they're both blind, and they're going through a, you know, an adventure, not even an adventure, they're going on a journey in life where they have Starkart's disease. And Starkart's disease is a form of macular degeneration of the eye. My mom has macular degeneration of the eye. I don't know if it's Starkart's disease or not, but you might know somebody that has Starkart's disease or any type of macular degeneration. This is two blind brothers. There's a, uh, a, simula a simulator in the bottom. This also is in mobile too. This is how these two brothers see every day. This is how they see every day. And it might be worse now. Before when I used to show this, the, the, the area that was visible was a lot bigger. But with degeneration, you don't get that back. Right? I had, I had uh, degenerative disc disease and I had to have back surgery at some point because they were just, it, there was no way to heal my discs anymore. They were just going to completely go, which they did end up going. I was, had to have surgery for that. But this is how these brothers see every day, right? And it's only going to get worse. This is why focus matters, because let's say you had some type of input on the screen, password, username, password, and let's say that you were typing and you went to go tab into your password, and just by muscle memory alone, because we use the same password for everything, you start typing and you get distracted. But you can still type your password. You go to look back at your machine and your password isn't in that input field. And you don't know where your password's at. You don't know even where you're at without an experience. So where'd your password go? Chances are something happened, it didn't get typed in, whatever. But I had somebody come up to me at a conference and they said, this happened to me. I started typing, I got distracted, there was no accessibility on this page, I didn't know where I was, and my password wasn't there, and I swear I was in that password field. Where did my password go? I don't know. And they said, luckily, they checked within a week, they checked all their bank statements, everything, credit cards, everything was fine, but they got super scared. And I talk about that all the time. Yes, it's a far-fetched example, but it's actually happened to somebody. That's why focus really matters, because you want to be able to see what you're interacting with on that page. So we have ARIA. Is anybody familiar with ARIA? Cool. So ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. So that's kind of like syntactical code that goes inside the code that you're writing to make things more accessible when accessibility states and properties aren't already there by default. We have a rule of ARIA, though. And the first rule of ARIA is don't use ARIA. Believe it or not, you should be using semantic markup at all costs. And once you're exhausted from that semantic markup, then you start using ARIA to help build out those experiences and making them accessible. We have a couple of different patterns out there, and I'm sure all of you have seen these patterns before. Social media components. This is a big one. We see it everywhere. Chances are that these images right here are some type of font icon from Font Awesome. You're not given the actual image itself. It's just like FA, FA dash, small, right? That's what it is. And maybe FA dash T for Twitter, or FA dash YT for YouTube. So you create a social media component. You're gonna do this with a unordered list and list items. When a screen reader goes to this and you're navigating through it and you're tabbing through it, it's not going to be able to read what it is if you don't bake in some ARIA. Because you want the screen reader to be able to announce to the user whether or not that is focusable and whether or not it can be interacted with. So the way you do that is you use an ARIA label. An ARIA label, ARIA labeled by are a lot of the common ones that you're going to usually see and or use in the experiences that you're pushing down the wire. You're going to want to use ARIA label, whatever the social media is, Twitter, whatever. And then if you bake in a little bit more, it'll be able to announce to the user button focusable or link focusable control shift option to interact and it'll say Twitter. So then you know, oh, hey, I can interact with this. It's got focus. It's going to Twitter. If I interact with that, boom, I'm going to have a tab open up for Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. So that's one common pattern that you're going to see in the wild. This is another one, a modal. 
Chances are you're gonna have some information, you're gonna have an X, you might have a button or two within that modal. That X is gonna be either a ampersand times semicolon, which is the character entity, one of the character entities for an X. It's gonna be the letter X, or it's gonna be an image, or it's gonna be a font icon. None of those things have semantic meaning to your user. They mean nothing. So let's say your user has this modal pop up and they're tabbing through it and they're trying to interact with it and they keep going in circles because it's reading ampersand times new Roman or ampersand times semicolon. And they go to a button and they go to another button and they go up to the main content, it reads it, and they hit tab again, ampersand times semicolon or X, X. That doesn't mean anything to your user. Well, how do you fix that? You fix that with an RE label. Bootstrap is really good about this. I don't know if foundation is, but if you're using Bootstrap, if you're in some type of organization where you are using Bootstrap, uh, Bootstrap does really good with their modals and how they handle this, and it's already baked in, so you don't have to worry about that. You would add a close or an exit. That way your user knows this is interactable. When they focus to it, they can click on that, write a little bit of JavaScript, that modal will close, shift that focus back to the main window, and they're good to go and they can keep moving on. So those are the two main patterns that you're gonna see out there. We have these things also too called roles. Not everything needs a role because we have semantic markup, right? So like header, you don't need a role of header with that. Your main element, you don't need a role of main because those things already are inherently accessible. Footer, on the other hand, you still need content in a role of content info. Not totally sure why that hasn't changed yet, but we have these right here. We have banner, content info, that would be for footer. If you have some type of header, in your application that isn't directly using the header element, you would use banner, complementary for complementary information on your page, and then you have your main, which you're never really gonna use main, but it's there and it's, hopefully it gets deprecated soon, so. Uh, if you wanna know more about ARIA roles, just Google, go to MDN, hopefully everybody's using Mozilla Developer Network. If you just Google Way ARIA or ARIA roles, Way stands for Web Accessibility Initiative, uh, you can definitely check it. There's so much information on ARIA roles and ARIA states and properties and principles, and there's just tons and tons of information out there. I hope all of you learned something today. I really appreciate everybody being in here. I hope you can go back and take some of the stuff you learned today. I hope you're happy about the stuff you learned today. I hope you're happy just to be at Stir Trek and be at a developer event. It's great to see all of you here. If you want these resources, it's a bit.ly. You can scan this. I'll leave this up for like four seconds, uh, but it's just bit.ly slash ally or a11y dash pitfalls. So I'll give you like a handful of seconds. One, two, three. Hopefully that does, does it pull up a GitHub markdown gist or something? Okay, cool. And if not, I can tweet out these resources too or put them on social media, whatever the case may be. That's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here at Stir Trek. Enjoy the rest of the day.